Well, let's uh, start our day with prayer. Lord, we just thank you. For this day, your day, Lord, Lord, we just want to honor you. We want to focus on your word. Lord, I pray that you would uh, guide our time this morning as we look at apologetics. Keep us from error, Lord. Lord, uh, draw us closer to you by our knowledge of your word. And bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. There are two handouts in the back, and if you're you know, just joining us now in this series, um, the reason uh, we have two is these sheets are intended to, first of all, be a study guide where you're following uh, the text of um, the summit curriculum for apologetics, the books Understanding the Times and uh, Understanding the Faith. And each week, I'm passing out a little study guide so that you can uh, read. There is a usually a chapter from the book and sometimes an additional article. I will put a website address on the sheet so that if you are following, you want to go to that website, you can uh, read that article too. So uh, basically, we're today, um, we are, this is our fourth session, and um, the topic is going to be supernatural good and evil. The uh, handout for next week is for next week's topic, isn't, Christian, uh, isn't Christianity anti-science? That being said, I'm actually going to go back to last week. We have a little bit of unfinished business on the... <clears throat> the topic for last week, and um, we were talking about how do secularists and the Bible disagree on the issue of man's ability to better himself? That was question number six from the handout for last week. So we're going to pick up there and uh, finish up the uh, questions for class three before we get into today's material. Secularists have a great faith and the ability of man to improve himself. All three humanist manifestos express optimism of man's ability to improve himself and, and create a better world. Most people aren't even familiar with the humanist manifestos but uh, what they do is they summarize secular humanism, which is a, still really the dominant worldview uh, in our culture. And uh, we'll be looking at those in detail when we use the Understanding the Times book, second part of this class. Um, but it's, it's a nice, concise explanation of the uh, secular humanist worldview. And they're, uh, they're, they're all very optimistic about the abilities of humankind to uh, better itself. The essence of the humanist worldview is faith in the human race's fundamental ability to better itself. Since they believe that man is essentially good, all he needs is a little more knowledge. He doesn't need discipline. He needs enlightenment. That's their feeling about it. So, so if he's failed, the remedy is uh, anger management class, where if he just had a little more knowledge, he'd be able to improve himself. 
While in contrast, the biblical view is that man by himself has no hope. Man needs a redeemer. We don't have the ability to get out of this mess that sin has caused. Now the good news is that God has provided our redeemer and God's ultimate solution is a new heaven and a new earth when Jesus returns. Ephesians 2.8 For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. The Bible also tells us that uh, God provides grace to overcome sin in this life, and this is what we, we call sanctification. It's a process of God working in an individual believer. There's a, a fundamental conflict about the future of humanity between what the Bible tells us and secular humanism and Marxism. Secularists strive for a man-made utopia on earth. The Bible tells us that only Jesus' return will make things right. Uh, following last week's sheet again, number seven, the, the question was, what is humanity's natural response to sin, and why is this Nat, uh, natural human response to sin mistaken. On uh, page 141, Jeff Meyer says in the book, humanity's natural response to sin is denial, then guilt, then fear, followed by a terrible sense of loneliness. The very first man tried to deny his responsibility for sin by blaming his wife. She, in turn, tried to blame the serpent. The history of philosophy and religion, which we talked about first class, and we kind of took this overarching view of the history of truth. And we saw in that that the history and philosophy uh, and the religions are uh, full of human attempts to escape the truth of man's guilt. A number of years ago, a Christian writer came out with a book entitled Tired of Trying to Measure Up. I don't know if any of you have read that book, but uh, unfortunately it gave a lot of unbiblical advice to Christians who were struggling with guilt feelings. The author said, the problem was that Christians often cause each other to feel ashamed. He said, Christians should not shame each other. He said, we need to tell each other that God accepts us just the way we are. Uh, I don't think he'd get along with Ray Comfort. We talked about that last uh, time. Um, but this is one failed attempt uh, to solve the problem of, uh, of guilt. The feeling of shame and guilt is not our main problem. It's a good thing in the sense that alerts us to the real problem. Like the pain of a burn on your hand tells you to take it out of the fire. Our main problem is what can be done about real guilt Adam and Eve tried to fix the shame by covering with fig leaves. And God showed them that a bloody sacrifice was necessary to cover their guilt. God addresses this terrible sense of loneliness that Jeff Myers is talking about. Um, he, he addresses it right there in the garden at the scene of uh, the original sin. And uh, can we put the first slide up there, um, Genesis 3, 14 and 15. So the Lord God said to the servant, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock 
and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Theologians call this proto-evangelism, the, the first instance of God's uh, given us, uh, you know, uh, hope, basically. Hope is given to Adam and Eve right back at the very site of the first sin, at the very beginning. The rest of the Bible progressively reveals God's plan for the redemption of his people. Regarding this terrible sense of loneliness that Jeff Myers is talking about. Um, I, I, I'm not real an expert on pagan religions, <laughs> but I remember at one time at least I read that um, all these, all the pagan worldviews have a very dark, gloomy, miserable vision of life after death. Um, that they, there's nothing in pagan religions that is anywhere near the Christian concept of, of a heaven or a new heaven and a new earth. I'm not real familiar with Greek mythology, but I think that's where we got the word Hades and the whole uh, concept of a dark uh, uh, underworld where everybody goes. Uh, question number eight, how would you explain to someone that grace is not merely a New Testament phenomena? Because some Christians, even some preachers and theologians, give that impression that, that grace is just a New Testament idea. They say the Old Testament reveals God's law, and it was not until the New Testament that we see God's grace. Well, throughout Chapter 6, Myers makes the point that grace is the basis of all God's covenants with man. The Old Testament narrative contains a series of covenants between God and men. He points out that covenants are different than contracts. Contracts focus on each individual's uh, rights and duties. Whereas covenants are other-centered. Their, their covenants are vows or promises, and uh, they're a love relationship. Marriage, of course, being the, uh, the best understanding that we can see from, from human relationships. But, but even though mankind fails to live up to his part of these covenants, there's a constant theme of hope throughout the Old Testament period. It's not in man's abilities, but the hope that come from God's promises. The God of Hebrews has, has the solution. And Myers points out that even in Jeremiah, when he's prophesying God's judgment, he's revealing God's grace. Grace has been in the word of God from the very beginning. Um, Meyer says on page 148, the prophets realized, though, that exile was not the last word. After exile comes restoration. Although the people might see the prophets as preaching judgment, their ultimate message is salvation. And then he quotes Jeremiah 29 verse 11 through 14. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, 
and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. And two chapters later, Jeremiah says in 31, 31, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. So this wonderful meta narrative of grace. Um, if you recall, that was the main theme of our uh, study for this last week. The meta narrative, the big picture that the Bible gives us. So this wonderful meta narrative of grace continues to unfold in Luke twenty two twenty where Jesus speaks of the fulfillment of the covenant. And Luke twenty two twenty 20 is in the same way. This is at the Last Supper. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So only when the Son of God becomes a man lives a sinless life, and becomes a perfect sacrifice is that requirement for God's covenant met. Uh, last question on the uh, assignment sheet or the study guide was, how does the meta narrative end? Um, Jesus brings a new heaven and a new earth in his second coming. I have a, a couple of postscripts on uh, this uh, theme that I've talked a little bit about here about guilt um, in relation to this phenomena that seems to be increasing, this idea of uh, deconstructing your faith. And uh, I just want to, it's like a Postscript here. Um, what do, what, first of all, what do we mean by the deconstruction of one's belief? Um, I almost want to ask you to raise your hands here, but I, you know, I, I'm I'm assuming that most of us in here know someone who is. It seems like, or at least that's been my experience. I know several uh, people who basically, they would even use the terms, they deconstructed their faith. Basically, they turned away from their uh, Christian background and upbringing. Um, so, so what do we mean? Well, to, to deconstruct <laughs> means to take apart. So this is based on the idea that a person's beliefs were constructed which is a postmodern idea that uh, they believe that their, their faith or their, their worldview is, is socially constructed. In one instance of a, a young lady, a 20 something young lady that I'm aware of, um, the person who deconstructed claimed that her thinking about God came from the people around her, socially constructed, from her parents, her youth pastor, her Christian peer group. And she described her deconstruction experience as, as liberating, as a, a feeling of great emotional relief, uh, catharsis, Bible or the dictionary, catharsis is, purging of emotions or, or relieving of, of emotional tension. And she also revealed feelings of resentment toward those in her life who constructed her views about God. And I've, I've also observed this in a, in a middle-aged man that uh, also reported he was walking away from his faith. Feeding, feeling uh, <clears throat> freedom, this idea, this feeling of freedom from guilt seems to be a big part 
of deconstruction. In both of these examples, the feeling of guilt is attributed to someone other than this person, okay? In both cases, the feeling of guilt seems to be a central factor. In both cases, the perceived enemy is whoever declares they're guilty, just like that book I was mentioned, you know. The problem is other Christians are making us feel ashamed. In both cases, the solution is denial of their guilt and rejection of who would declare them guilty. Uh, assuming this scenario is true for at least some of these cases of deconstruction, I want to just take a little bit of time talking about what we as parents and acquaintances can do that might help prevent young people from deconstructing. So I got a few points there. First of all, on the issue of guilt, we need to clarify our own thinking. Every human being is guilty of sin and deserving of eternal damnation. Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Again, in Romans 3, 12, excuse me, 10 to 12. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. So this means submitting our own observations and our, our own opinions, our own feelings to the authority of God's word. If our observations were objective, they would confirm that all people are sinners, are sinners especially ourselves. But... We have prejudices, feelings, biases that cloud our objectivity. Pride and emotional attachments, they interfere with our perception of reality. And then many who admit sin is uh, universal argue that it doesn't deserve eternal punishment. And they, again, through their own biases, they, they fail to see the utter holiness of God. They minimize the seriousness of sin. And they defend themselves against God, God's declaration of their guilt. So, my first point. We first need to settle this issue in our own minds. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. We need to make sure our thinking is in agreement with the Word of God. Second, we need to understand the times and the culture that we're currently living in. Today's secular values and attitudes are radically different than even a generation or two ago. The focus, interests, and values of our current culture run contrary to submitting to the Word of God. Your kids aren't growing up in your grandfather's world. Your kids are living in an over-emotional, self-centered culture. What are some of the traits of the modern culture that encourage deconstruction? Well, there's an extreme emphasis on feelings, emotions. Style is more important than substance. What do I mean by that? Well, how nice a person treats you is more important than what he tells you. A real friend, according to that view, is, would never say anything to make you feel bad. There is a 
huge emphasis today on self, rights, subjectivity, self-interest, self-esteem. Duty and responsibility are no longer stressed. Self-sacrifice is not valued. Respect, honor, and obedience to authority is neglected and rejected. So we need to understand the times. Third, we can train our children from an early age with the goal of building character that will be resistant to attacks on their faith. It's not just an issue of doctrine. Uh, it's also an issue of character. The attack on our youth is more than a, uh, an issue of content of what they believe. Reason and logic and evidence, really, they're not the enemy's weapons. Enemy has no advantage over the Bible when it comes to logic evidence. It's all stacked on our side. In other words, we're not going to get out-reasoned by the devil. The word of God is stands strong. Yes, we should do everything possible to prepare our youth. 1 Peter 3.15 to be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give you the reason for the hope that you have. Yes, this is an area where many Christian parents and church ministries have fallen short. I, I don't know how many of you might have read the, Ken Ham has a number of books out. Um, one of them was called Already Gone. And it's about the failure of typical Sunday school to give a foundation in the truth of, fundamental truths of the faith uh, to uh, our young people. So definitely this is uh, important. But the point I'm trying to make here, too, is this. Besides Bible knowledge, our youth needs strength of character to resist the tax on their faith. Much of the attack on a young person's face today is emotional. The culture places emphasis on how a person feels about basic biblical truth, like guilt of sin. From an early age, our children need to learn that sometimes truth doesn't feel good. They need to be trained to tell the truth and to admit the truth. These habits of character need to be trained into a child in everyday situations and everyday relationships from an early age. And this is the thing that might shock, a, a, you know, a Reformed church, but correct biblical doctrine might not be enough in the hands of a person with weak character. And fourth... We need to instill in them a love and respect for the authority of the Word of God. Secular culture glorifies self-expression, independence, autonomy. Submission is vilified. Obedience is ridiculed. Again, from an early age, children need to know that the God of the Bible knows infinitely more than any other source of knowledge. And they need to know that he loves them more than any human could. And that he would never lie to us. And that he's trustworthy. And that his word is full of wisdom for every possible situation. So I just, uh, that was kind of an afterthought. I think I've mentioned a few times that the whole reason I've been doing apologetics for the last, I don't know, six or seven years, is, uh, is just, just how uh, it's um, just seeing these, these young folks that, that do this deconstruct. And um, 
I think there's uh, probably not, I'm not probably not alone on uh, concern about it. Um, anyway, all right, uh, we're going to move into the content for today. Uh, so this would be the uh, study guide for class four. Um, the subject is supernatural good and evil. And um, there was uh, a, a section of the textbook, and then there was an article um, called The uh, Infallible Proofs of the Resurrection. I gave you answers in Genesis website on the sheet, so hopefully some of you uh, read that. Um, we're going to use the study guide questions as our outline, and we'll begin with number one. How did the Bible, uh, explain how the Bible is not just an account of a teacher with a good moral philosophy. So the focus for the um, session here is um, supernatural, the supernatural good and evil. When I was 21, like most of my 21-year-old friends, I thought I knew everything. And my friends and I thought Jesus was cool. And uh, so was Muhammad, and, and so was Buddha, and so was Gandhi, and Martin Luther King Jr. They were all good moral teachers. They were all cool human beings. It's amazing how ignorant we were. And it's amazing how ignorant people are today about the differences in their lives and the claims of those, that list of diverse individuals. I wish somebody would have slapped me up the side of the head and reminded me that this Jesus is much more than a great moral teacher. Jesus claimed to be God. None of those others did. Jesus' followers said he rose from the dead. Jesus performed many miracles during his life on earth. Jesus did supernatural things. But in my experience as a young man, there was not much emphasis on the supernatural side of Jesus. Meyer says on page 270 in the textbook, he says, since the age of the Enlightenment, some have tried to present Christianity without the supernatural. Thomas Jefferson wrote a Bible with all references to miracles and Jesus' deity removed. I mean, was he embarrassed by the gospel? Has the modern church been timid about emphasizing the supernatural in its evangelism. Paul stakes the validity of the Christian faith on whether Christ bodily rose from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. And if Christ is not raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Meyer says, Christianity is quite different from all other faiths in that it relies heavily on miracles to provide faith in ways which other religions, such as Islam, do not. The Greek word for miracle is, here we go, semios, probably murdered it, but, um, which means sign. Um, so, uh, question number two was, explain why Mark Twain's famous statement that faith is believing what you know ain't so is not true. Well, Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, he's saying that religion is based on unsubstantiated belief that cannot be proved. His argument is based on the exception uh, an acceptance of the presupposition of philosophical naturalism. 
This is the dominant view in 21st century America. His presupposition disallows even the possibility of miracles. So the, the concept of a presupposition is like this is something that it's an axiom. It's something that you have assumed to be true, and it's the basis for how you interpret everything else. Number three said, explain each of the following terms. Miracle, okay, a supernatural sign or event that is tended to highlight the power and goodness of God. Materialism, the belief that reality is composed solely of matter. Naturalism, the belief that everything that exists is composed of natural entities that can be explained and justified through scientific investigation. Anything said to exist outside of nature, such as God, is thought by naturalists to either not exist or be unknowable. Those who embrace materialistic, naturalistic assumptions find it impossible to believe in a supernatural world. It's important to remember that materialist naturalists don't prove that the supernatural doesn't exist. They assume the supernatural does not exist and they build their worldview upon that. Uh, number four said, how is the scientific method limited in obtaining knowledge? The scientific method is a process of empirical inquiry that seeks to understand the phenomena of the physical world through hypothes uh, 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 hypothesizing, observing, measuring, experimenting, predicting and testing, scientific method. Since the coming of the Enlightenment, the dominant worldview in the Western world has been to view science as almost unlimited in its ability to solve all mankind's problems. It's going to be the theme of, the, of next week. But the scientific method makes sense only in a material world where things observed can be explained through natural processes. Number five said, if Jesus' body were found in the tomb, what would his enemies most likely do with his body? So well, there's, I didn't really go off on uh, that whole theme, but um, it, it's interesting to uh, Place yourself back at uh, the time of just after the resurrection and just kind of a, just a, put a little imagination into you know, what, what would the people, what would be the enemy's approach, uh, the enemies of the truth of the uh, gospel. Um, for example, in this case, they'd, they'd probably display the corpse uh, to expose the fraud in their mind, the fraud that Jesus was alive. How many people saw Jesus after he rose from the dead? 1 Corinthians 15, 6. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 6. Why do people in modern times resist believing in the supernatural? Well, we live in a time and a culture that insists that the natural world is all there is. Acceptance of the reality of the supernatural, of even supernatural evil, interferes with the idea that mankind is in control of the world. If the supernatural evil exists, the possibility of supernatural good becomes real. The denial of the existence of supernatural spirituality 
is man's way of avoiding accountability to God. Great effort is put in giving natural explanations of supernatural evil. Meyer says, page 294, he says, for materialist humanists, the residue of enchantment is a serious problem. Society cannot advance until people become sufficiently disenchanted with spiritual things. He goes on, many Christians, in an attempt to meet the challenges of materialism, naturalism, try to explain things such as demon possession in terms that seem more scientifically acceptable, terms like you know, mental illness. Other Christian counselors, such as Jay Adams, strongly resist this approach. And he's a quote from, from Jay Adams. He says, organic malfection, uh, malfunctions affecting the brain that are caused by brain damage, tumors, gene inheritance, glandular chemical disorders, validly may be termed as mental illness. But here's the point. But at the same time, a vast number of other human problems have been classified as mental illness, which there is no evidence that they have been in, uh, endangered by disease at all. There's a, we, could, we could go way off into a, a whole side point here about Christian counseling, and I'm, I'm, there's people here in this church that are way more under, versed in that than I am, but it's, it's a huge issue of understanding the spiritual causes of uh, human behavior. And, um, number eight, how does the presence of spiritual evil highlight the power of Jesus? Well, other religions portray evil spiritual beings with power, sometimes equal and more powerful uh, than their they're good gods or their main divinities. The absolute superiority of the Lord Jesus in the Bible is never in doubt. But scripture also reminds us that supernatural evil powers do exist and they're real and they, they can be harmful. Number nine. Why do modern Americans often fail to see miracles and supernatural evil when it happens. Well, again, the idea of a presupposition. It's a closed-minded assumption uh, and uh, their, their faith in science has basically blinded them. Number 10, how is the statement, the greatest trick the devil ever played was to convince the world he didn't exist. Why is that true for many modern Americans? Well, most modern Americans tend to attribute everything they observe to natural causes. The underlining assumption is that in past times, before we had modern science, many things were thought to have supernatural causes. But now that we have uh, naturalistic answers. We don't need supernatural explanations. We no, no longer need a devil, no longer need God. Number 11, how, did, how does belief in supernatural evil change a person's understanding of reality? Evil that cannot be explained by natural causes has a sobering effect. The skeptic's presupposition of naturalism is challenged, needs to be challenged. To be open to the truth of the gospel requires a belief in the supernatural. So uh, those are the questions that were part of the uh, textbook reading. I want to go now into this article from Answers in Genesis by Tim Chafee um, on the, uh, infa the title was Infallible Proofs of the Resurre Resurrection. Uh, number one says, 
if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then Christianity would be a false religion. Explain how this statement is true. So I'm going to quote Jim Chafee. He says, now consider the alternative. If Jesus actually rose from the dead, then an astonishing miracle was performed. And through this act, God placed his seal of approval on the life and work of Jesus for all to see. In other words, the resurrection shows, shows us that God affirmed the truth of Christ's teaching, meaning that Jesus is exactly who he claimed to be, the eternal Son of God in the human flesh and the Savior of the world. He is the only one who can save us from sin, the only way to the Father, John 14, 6. All who reject him are doomed to suffer eternally for despising the Lord of life and his offer of forgiveness. Number two says, why have the critics and skeptics tried desperately to develop alternative theories to explain away the resurrection, quoting Chafee again. Everything hinges on the resurrection. If Jesus rose, he is the Son of God, and Christianity is true. Consequently, critics and skeptics have tried desperately to develop alternative theories to explain away the resurrection. In their vain search for a legitimate alternative, they have demonstrated that they understand the centrality of the resurrection better than some Christians. Or at least, they're more concerned about it. Uh, number three, some skeptics claim that the idea of the resurrection was simply a legend that grew for several decades before it was written down. Why is this not true? 1 Corinthians 15, um, let's see, yep. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised the third day according to scriptures, and he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as one uh, abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and I do not deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. So... Paul wrote 1 Corinthians just a few years after the resurrection, which rules out that theory that the... Uh, it's amazing. It's amazing to me how many just really wild, unbased theories uh, that keep on being uh, presented as an alternative to the facts. Paul cites a bunch of eyewitnesses uh, when, in uh, verse 15, uh, excuse me, chapter 15, verse 6, uh, he says, most of whom uh, were, were still alive. Uh, number uh, four, um, what did Jesus say to the Pharisees about the resurrection? This is, uh, let's see. Go to next, go to the next slide here. I'm not sure. Yeah, there we go. Jesus said on multiple occasions that his death and resurrection would be the one sign he would give to the unbelieving and wicked generation. We, we heard about this in Seth's sermon just a, a couple of weeks ago. When asked by the Jews to perform a sign, he predicted his resurrection by saying, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. That's John uh, 
2, 19 to 22. Later, some scribes and Pharisees asked him for a sign. And Jesus replied, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Number five says, what is the main cause of unbelief in the resurrection resurrection of Jesus? Again, Tim Chafee says, some may wonder how a proof could be called infallible when so many people refuse to believe it. In the case of the risen Jesus, the problem was not with the evidence. After all, he was standing in front of them and could be touched and heard. Even today, the problem is not with the infallible proof of Scripture, nor is there a problem with the evidence from history or archaeology. The main problem with humanity's uh, is with humanity's stubborn, rebellious heart. Uh, can I have Luke 16? Here we have the story of, of the rich man and Lazarus. In it, the rich man, who is suffering in hell, is pleading for someone to come and warn his family members. It says, so that they will not come to this place. In chapter 16, set verse 27, he answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will also come to this, uh, they, will all, they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And he said to him, if they did not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. There's a popular evangelist, preacher, big megachurch guy um, who has, uh, I think, really missed the point here, um, claiming that, you know, his, his, his viewpoint is that the events of the New Testament are what we base our faith on. And the, the contrary view is, no, it's, it's, the, it's the word of God. And um, here we have an example where in this last verse he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. The word of God says it's by, it's by hearing the word. Um, in other words, as I read this, I, I see the point being made that even if you saw it with your own eyes, that's not how faith comes. Faith doesn't come from visual observation. It comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. And uh, so if they didn't listen to Moses and the prophets, they were not convinced even as someone rises from the dead. Um, I'm just making a plea here that we, you know, our, our uh, means of faith is through hearing the word. And um, so, okay. Um, and so what do we come back to? You know, why the question was, you know, what was the main cause? We're back to this idea that the heart of the, human problem is the problem of the human heart. 
hardness of heart. So, okay, um, I, uh, I think we'll just call it a day at this point. The, um, it's hardly worth starting. Uh, the, the topic for, for next week is probably going to take more than one week. Um, we'll see how far we get, but isn't uh, Christianity anti-science? In the next few weeks, we're going to gradually uh, get into the evolution issue. And we're going to begin by uh, taking a look at um, some of the false uh, narrative that has actually been deliberately put out there to discredit Christianity as backward uh, superstitious anti-science. And so that's going to be the, the theme of our uh, time next week. So, so let's close with prayer. Lord, we thank you. Lord, I pray that there was something of value in what we just talked about. Lord, uh, Pray that you would bless the rest of this morning, bless Seth's talk and our worship time, and uh, this, this is your day, Lord. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen.